Ready? Okay. Good evening. My name is Cindy Assini. I'm the supervisor of social studies and gifted and talented here in Hillsboro. And I wanted to welcome you and thank you for giving up of your Thursday evening to spend some time with us. We hope that it is worth your time and that you walk away having learned about gifted and talented programming here in Hillsboro and also about the unique needs of children who have a combination of high ability, high creativity, and high task commitment. We'll get further into that as this goes on. So I'm going to do an overview of, of the gifted and talented philosophy in Hillsboro. Then I'm going to hand off to our expert, Dr. Joan Ruderman, who will give an overview of the research about gifted and talented individuals. And then I'll wrap up kind of where to go from here. So that's a, a brief overview of this talk tonight. And again, we'll try to get you home to your families as soon as we can, while also making sure that you learn everything that we hope you learn. So just as far as other people you can reach out to in the district who are also here to support the needs of our high ability and high, highly creative students, we have three gifted specialists in the, in the district. That's down from seven last year. Um, because there, there was a, a decrease in the teachers in Hillsboro. So at Amsterdam and Triangle School, you can reach out to Tina Mandrasha at HES and Woodfern, there's Maureen Donofsky, and at Sunnymead and Woods Road, there's Suzanne Viznowski. There are also a number of teachers in the district that have gotten um, a certificate in gifted and talented education through Rutgers University, and they teach in a number of schools, including here at Otten Road and the middle school. I'll go back to our mission statement a few times and also some board policies to help you understand why we have the programming that we have. So our mission statement as a school district really asks us to help all students develop to their fullest potential. And gifted and talented learners are, are a specific part of our population. So we'll go through tonight information about them and how we do our best with the resources we have to meet their needs. This is the board policy that relates to gifted and talented programming, which is based on the state code. So it requires us to identify exceptionally able students, and how we do so is not just because I think so or a teacher thinks so, it's because we look across the peer group of a certain grade and then look to see who in that group, when compared to the other students, needs modification to their programming in terms of additional challenge in order to succeed. So oftentimes I have parents that I talk with that say, my child is getting all threes on their report card and they're doing everything the teacher asks. I go to conferences and the teachers say that they're doing wonderfully. I've never gotten any constructive criticism. And then they didn't qualify for the REACH program. So how is that possible? So I want to go through one set of characteristics. Now, being a mom myself, I can say that if my son is attentive and he works really hard, gets along well with other classmates, is happy to go to school, teacher says he has great ideas and that he's learning, if this list of characteristics, my son falls into that category, it's a great thing. So that, one way you can look at it is a child being bright. We had a former superintendent here who used to refer to those students as the shiny apple students. Um, everything looks wonderful and they're doing great with their teacher. Now, let me give you a different set of characteristics, which are also great, but very different. So let's take a different child in class who might um, have these really interesting connections that no one can really understand except that particular child, maybe not even the teacher, doesn't know how they got from A to B. Um, they could prefer working with older kids or adults, could be very strong emotional reactions to different things that go on, um, and constantly wanting to learn, just insatiable in terms of appetite for learning and, and whatever their interest is. So that, according to the research, is where giftedness falls. That extreme out there. So we have many children that do very well in Hillsboro, that go on to take honors and AP classes and earn admission to wonderful colleges who don't participate in the REACH program. So a, a metaphor for this, if you watch The Simpsons or are familiar with it, Lisa Simpson is the bright child. I would parent or teach Lisa any day 
Bart's the gifted child. At, when I started earlier in my career, that I was fortunate enough to attend the National Association for Gifted Children Conference, and one of the parents who spoke um, was the mother of Jack Andraka, who at, I think, 14, started developing a test for pancreatic cancer in his basement. He once knocked out the power to his entire neighborhood with a Tesla coil. That's the Bart Simpson. That's the kid that we don't want to have fall through the cracks because his interests are so unique and the way he addresses them are so creative that he really needs other programming in order to succeed. Not writing on the chalkboard. We don't, we don't do that with kids here. Don't worry. So the diff if you want a, an easy analogy to remember, bright children versus gifted children, there's your Lisa and Bart scenario. So what does this mean in the classroom? When you have bright children, they could still need a number of repetitions to learn. When you have a kid who's really functioning on the high ability end of the spectrum, they might already know most things, or they might only need to hear it once and then they know it, and they can apply it, and they can extend it. So that's why we have a variety of programs here in Hillsborough to try to offer opportunities for those kids who are on the gifted side of the spectrum to really follow their interests. So again, I bring you back to the board policy. I don't make it up. My job, and it's one of the more painful parts of my job, is to compare students to each other. To figure out who are the kids who, without that extra programming, are going to be doing the equivalent of knocking the power out to the neighborhood. So what do we do with the very extremely limited resources that we have to devote to gifted and talented learners? We have a specialist per two elementary schools, and what they're able to do is focus on enrichment support mostly for K2, but in some buildings, depending on the need, it may also be in grades three and four. And then in grades three and four, for students who are formally identified, there's a pullout program where students meet with the gifted specialist, usually twice over the six-day cycle, um, which is, again, having the specialist split between schools quite a challenge as far as scheduling goes. Um, however, we did work it out so that students have a similar amount of time this year as they had last year um, in terms of the pullout program. We're just able to do less enrichment support now with fewer specialists. So, the K-4 program really focuses on creative thinking and um, moving students through project-based learning at, at an a accelerated and also independent, independent pace. As far as in grades 5 to 12, social studies teachers teach a section of social studies that is aimed at meeting the needs of gifted and talented learners as best as possible in that type of a setting. So it's the grade level social studies curriculum with projects embedded for students to express their creativity and go above and beyond in terms of research. So that's five to eight. Once we get into Auton Road, the middle school and high school, there are also a lot of extracurricular offerings that students can partake in to really expand on their interests and delve deep into subjects that they're passionate about. We also have honors and AP classes at the high school. Something else that I think is important for parents to know is that all each program that we have in the district, so let's say advanced math in sixth grade, or the REACH pullout program in third and fourth grade, or AP chemistry in the high school, each of those courses has its own criteria for participation. And the criteria relates directly to how do we know a child is likely to be successful in that class. So for example, I do the placements for honors social studies in the high school. So we look at social studies assessments. We do an assessment that the honors teachers at the high school actually grade. So we're getting a variety of perspectives then on the student work and taking a number of data points into consideration to say to all the students, according to these four data points, we think that you'll succeed in this class. Or we think that you need another year to develop these skills before you succeed in this type of an environment. So that's the gifted programming in grades 5 to 12, with the exception of the senior outreach program, which is way far away, I know, from second grade. But if 0 to 3 is anything like grades 2 to 12, then we're all going to be there before we know it. Um, it just seems like you, know, you wake up one day and you have a newborn, and then the next day you have a kid who's speaking in full sentences to you. So the internship program is a great opportunity in the high school for students to 
partner with a community organization and work on a capstone project to better our community um, through their work there. At this point, I want to give a bit of a more formal introduction to Dr. Ruddeman. Dr. Ruddeman was the gifted and talented specialist for West Windsor Plainsboro School District for years. She has won awards, um, very involved in National History Day in the state of New Jersey, earned her doctorate at Columbia University, and um, really can't say enough about how much she is respected in the field of gifted and talented in the state of New Jersey. She taught some of the courses here when we had the gifted certificate program, so partnering with Rutgers University. So Dr. Rodeman has a career full of knowledge, some great anecdotes to share with you, and a lot of research to help you better understand the difference between our students who do really well and are very bright, and our students who really need to make sure that they are getting that additional programming to meet the needs of um, the combination of high ability, creativity, and task commitment. So with no further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Ruddeman. Thanks. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been coming for several years, and it's always good to be up here in Hillsboro, and I have great admiration for Cindy um, and the program that she has helped to develop here that I think that is, is very, um, uh, supportive of students and um, compassionate and understanding of what kids needs are. Um, what I wanted to do here is share a little bit about what we've learned over the years about giftedness. Um, the Hillsborough definition is the definition from the Department of Education and the National Association of Children. It goes all the way back to early 90s. That gifted learners or children and youth with outstanding talent, outstanding talent, who perform or have the potential for performing at remarkably high levels of accomplishment when compared with others of their age and their experience and their environment. So this is the kid that's, you know, creating the cure for pancreatic cancer in his basement, <laughs> or it's an extreme. Uh, much of my philosophy comes from Joe Renzulli, who has been at the University of Connecticut Nag Center for many, many years. He is um, a real leading thinker, innovator in the field of gifted ed. Um, when Joe began his thinking and writing about giftedness, probably 40, almost now 50 years ago, he was vilified in the community because he did not follow the prescribed understandings of gifted being high IQ and being measured by a number and um, good school behaviors and having that excellence um, in school. Um, Joe came about, came at this from a very different perspective. He ultimately came up with this, his three rings theory that gifted behavior, and note we're not talking about giftedness, we're talking about gifted behaviors, what kids are actually doing, is above average ability. He's not talking about extreme high IQ, he's talking about above average ability. Creativity, so what do they do with that high and above average ability? And then ultimately, task commitment. Um, if you know anything about Angela Duckworth's work, she's at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's written an excellent book called Grit, G-R-I-T. I highly recommend it to all of you to read for yourselves and for your children. But Joe Renzulli was on this 50 years ago. Understanding that gifted behavior is when that, that deep intrinsic motivation, that task commitment, drives the high ability child or person to be creative and innovative. We appreciate um, and understand the concept of schoolhouse gifted. Um, and Cindy began this way. The kid, the bright shiny apple, they love to go to school, they're the teacher's ideal. Parents, you love them. They are cooperative, they I uh, like to do their homework, I like to play school. Um, there's really nothing 
that you can say negative about these kind of kids. They're just their dreams. Are they gifted? Maybe, but they are it, the idea that they they understand how to play the school game really well, and they they always uh, will do well in school. These are kids that are going to go to the college of their choice. They're going to get a career and be wonderful in their career, and they're going to be very happy, contented people. Um, I always say at this point to parents, so be careful what you wish for. You know, if you wish for your child to be highly gifted, you might have. <laughs> you might have a Bart Simpson on your hands. Gifted students show evidence of schoolhouse gifted behaviors, but they are also highly intrinsically motivated. They go beyond classroom expectations. They have interests that are outside of the curriculum. These are the kids that it just is getting good, mom, and we have to go to the next chapter. You know, in science or in social studies or in health class, or in language arts. They want to dig deeper. Um, they exhibit an interest and analysis that's not generally typical for their age level. Um, and sometimes this is not a good fit for school because they, their, their intrinsic motivation starts to push against the strictures and the structure of the classroom. Um, one of the things that we are aware of and one of the reasons that I'm so glad that you're here tonight is that the role that parents can play in alleviating some of this frustration and giving kids outlets that they might not have in school but they can certainly have at home where they can get, dig deeper, they can explore, um, they don't have to, to march to the beat of the drummer in school, they can march to their own beat. These kind of people are our creative producers. These are the, the people that are innovators and inventors. Gifted education should provide a rigorous pace, <coughs> some element of student choice, and a meaningful purpose. So I want to frame this in the context of what school is. Generally in a classroom, and as a classroom teacher for many years, our responsibility is to a whole class of students, a whole group of kids. And so we pace ourselves not too fast and not too slow. So some of our kids, are, we're helping them to, to keep up, and some of the kids are ready to just move further faster. You explain something twice, they've got it but as a classroom teacher, you need to explain it or go through it <coughs> two or three more times. So gifted kids really like a rigorous pace. Often that can't be done completely in the classroom, but what Hillsborough has done is provides opportunities for kids outside <coughs> of the classroom, and then when they get to the um, REACH program in the um, upper elementary and middle schools, that they can explore things deeper and at their own pace within social studies classrooms. These are kids that like some element of choice. They like to be able to make their own decisions. These are the kids when a teacher assigns a project and they're to make a poster, they say, can I make it three-dimensionally? Can I make a round poster? Do I have to make a poster at all? So, um, for very, for very structured teachers, this can create problems. For, for the teachers here in Hillsborough, that's not a problem. So an element of choice that, that is embedded in what they are doing. And then ultimately, a meaningful purpose. Schoolhouse gifted kids really understand grades. And they really are um, enthused and can be coerced, you know, or motivated by grades. Highly gifted people could care less about the grade and it makes it very difficult sometimes for them to fit into a classroom situation because you'll say, parents, you'll say, if you don't do this, you're gonna get a bad grade and the gifted kid's gonna say, so what? <laughs> Which is very frustrating. The meaningful purpose, what in education we call authentic assessment or authentic purpose, <coughs> is that um, they write something that someone is really genuinely going to read, like a letter to the editor, or a story that's going to be read beyond their teacher. 
um, that they're going to do work that's meaningful and that will be assessed or understood by people beyond just the classroom. I, I've often used the expression that a, a classroom is often like a ping pong game. The teacher serves, the kids return it, the teacher serves, the kids return it, right? Teacher makes the assignment, kids do the assignment, turn it into the teacher who gives them a grade, gives it back to the kids. One of the things that I love about National History Day, which I'm so proud, because I've mentored these teachers and they've done extraordinary things, um, the students at Hillsborough now have an opportunity to do the, the New Jersey History Day program, which is a, a national, at this point, an international program. Um, there is that element of choice, and there is definitely authentic as, um, assessment. Um, students that do extensive research on a project uh, have to stand and deliver in front of a panel of, of three judges. Um, they are not graded. They're not graded by their teacher. They are, they are working towards an ideal um, of what good research looks like and a good presentation to express that research um, is. Meaningful, authentic assessment. You have, at the high school, the outreach program, which is the senior internship program. This is an extraordinarily good program to have in your district, and you should be really proud of it, where these kids go out into your community, and they work at physical therapy um, businesses. They work for florists. They work at daycare centers. They work for the town the municipal building, they go to the li they work at the library. And when I say work, literally, they are working as if they are in the real world. They are accountable for uh, work that they're assigned to do. They're not necessarily graded, but they're definitely assessed. None of you receive a grade when you go out to your jobs, but you're constantly assessed and you are constantly held accountable. That's real world. And it's, um, it's very exciting to see the, the growth in the students as they experience this, some for the fir first time. Gifted education should require research skills, critical thinking and analysis and problem solving skills, communication skills, both with communicating with a mentor and communicating and collaborating with members of a team. Um, and that they need to share a product or a presentation. If you're looking at this and you're thinking, whew, that sounds like my job. It is. This is real world. This is um, Partnership for 21st Century Skills that was developed probably now more than 10 years ago. Um, the concept of what do our students need to do to be successful in the 21st century? I have to just do an aside here. So we. Several years ago, um, I was sitting in with a group of teachers, and it was probably 2013, maybe something like that. And the presenter was saying something about, um, we have to prepare our students for the 21st century. And someone in the audience said, our students have never lived anywhere else but the 21st century. I think we're the ones that have to get up to speed for the 21st century. I'll speak for myself. Um, but these are skills that, that everyone needs. Um, our gifted kids often are ready for this sooner and need this sooner than um, their peers, their age level peers. They're ready to do research and find answers. They're ready to be authentically assessed. Um, and they certainly like the critical thinking analysis and problem solving. Who says this? Um, this is a, a, a brief um, list of people that I have researched. There's many more on this list, many more since I created this list. Um, constantly being analyzed in the field of education. But I just want you to know that, that what you're going to see now comes is, is grounded in research. Going back to some things that Cindy uh, began, which I think is very important. There are characteristics of gifted students. Look at the positives. They're unusually alert. They're rapid learners. They have superior language skills. They enjoy learning. They have keen observations and analytical ability. They're, they have high capacity for memory. Um, 
They are insightful, often seeing the big picture. They have high levels of concentration and attention spans. They ask a lot of questions. They're searching for connections. They're intense, highly motivated, and often have strong empathy for what's going on around them. Very positive. Uh, but there's the negatives for these same individuals. Sometimes there's an uneven mental development. Kids that are really, really, really bright in math often are slow to catch up with their language ability. Um, often kids that are very, very bright um, intellectually are emotionally um, young. I am a great advocate and fan of um, the Big Bang Theory and you have a series of people that are highly, highly brilliant. And over the years of that series, it was fascinating for me to watch um, the character developments as, as um, Sheldon in particular struggles to learn what sarcasm is, which struggles to learn how to be polite, how to have relationships with people, how to be a, an appropriate friend. He just didn't get it. And when we first met Sheldon, he didn't care. And he learned to care, and he learned to care enough that about other people's feelings that he worked at becoming more social and, and kinder and a better friend. Um, that speaks to the interpersonal difficulties that they sometimes have. Um, there might be levels of underachievement, especially in areas that they just aren't interested in. You know, they could care less about it, so they're not going to. This is part of the nonconformist piece of it. They can be excessively critical. They can have poor self images because of perfectionism. And m many gifted people struggle with perfectionism. Um, having to be perfect. Not only they have to be perfect, those around them have to be perfect. So if you have one of these critters in your household, you have already experienced this. Mother, that's not the way you do it. No, it's, that's there, it's very precise. Um, and we learned to, to work with them. It can be highly opinionated. Um, and then they can have extreme feelings of being different. One of the benefits of having some type of gifted program is to provide opportunities for like-minded kids to be together. I had a, a wonderful experience in West Windsor where I taught middle school kids for years and they are, they are really quirky individuals. And then you layer on top of that these elements of giftedness and they had some really difficult times. One of the things that we did is provided a room, a space, um, and long before we heard about safe spaces, we created a room, and it was our, where the kids could come um, during their recess or before school or during their study hall time or during their pointed prism time and just hang out. And that's where they found people who were like them, people that got their jokes, people that actually watched the news in the morning and were ready to discuss what was going on in the world. Many of them, particularly the ones that had good interpersonal skills, had learned to play the game. And I had in my classroom kids that were cheerleaders and kids that were in sports and that, you know, they were in the band and they were just, they, teachers loved them. And, but deep down inside, they had a real hunger to find people that had the, that shared their interests that was beyond playing the school game. Um, that's something that parents can provide. You can be the safe place for your kids to come home. You might hear from teachers that your son or daughter um, are, are wonderfully, um, they, they're wonderful friends, they get along with everyone, um, they're really cooperative, and you're like, are they talking? about the same kid because the kid that comes home and walks into your house is querulous argumentative sullen you know even our little ones I mean the the ones that are they're supposed to be so cute and perky and darling and they come home and they're kind of morose for many days 
they are emotionally exhausted if if you are different and not like everyone else and you have different interests um, if you if you learn at a different pace and you spend the entire day making yourself pace yourself to what's going on around you um, doing everything that's expected of you um, instead of having lunch by yourself and getting to finish your book you have lunch with everybody else because that's what's expected you go out for recess you don't really want to go out for recess you would like to just stay in and read your book but no you go out for recess and kick the ball around and pretend that you're you know like a normal kid and then you come home and you're just worn out so if you have one of these very unique people in your household understand what they need when they get home is time to themselves they time to to make decisions about what they want to do um, time to just relax a little bit where they don't have to put on um, something that's going to be appropriate for the world what we're going to see now is called a word wall this was taught to me years ago by uh, someone that was savvier about social media than I am um, and what I'm going to show you is a um, aspects of giftedness through several lenses emotional cognitive physical we'll start with cognition because we think in terms of giftedness as the academic or the intellectual when it's writ large it means it's something that we can pretty much understand uh, throughout the world of giftedness writ small is sometimes we see this but in cognition with gifted people, what we expect to see, what we understand is they have original and unusual ideas. They're creative. They like to make connections, often between seemingly, um, seemingly unrelated ideas. They have superior abilities to reason and to generalize and problem solve. The idea of high intelligence. Sometimes they have a rich and vivid imagination. And sometimes they have an extensive vocabulary if they're verbal kind of people. Sometimes they appear to learn things very rapidly. Sometimes an excellent long-term memory. Sometimes they grasp mathematical skills and scientific concepts readily. Maybe they're the kid that's real verbal and they're not so much mathematical or vice versa. They may be an avid reader. They may present complex and deep abstract thinking and thoughts. Sometimes their mind seems to run on multiple tracks. They might be very fast, sometimes. Perception and emotion. Highly sensitive. Highly sensitive to what's going on around them. Highly sensitive to emotions of people. Um, sometimes sensitive for physical. There's a guy named Nebrowski that did a lot of studies with this. With um, highly gifted kids don't like to wear blue jeans. They don't like the, the fabric, the stiffness of the fabric. So you see some, I had a I had a wonderfully gifted young man, and he wore shorts all the time, year-round, here in New Jersey. Um, coldest day of the year, he'd have shorts on because he didn't like the, the feeling of, of pants, pant legs. Um, so there can be physical, but also an emotional sensitivity. They have unusual senses of humor. Um, Sheldon had a, a crazy sense of humor, and he cracked himself up. Nobody else got it, but he thought he was just wickedly funny. One of the neatest dissertation topics I, I saw when I was at Columbia was a, a woman, this goes back to the 90s, um, and she was looking at this idea of senses of humor in gifted children, preschoolers. So this is New York City, and she taught in a school for gifted preschoolers, like only in New York, you know, honestly. But she carried around uh, file cards what, where she would listen and observe what, what made kids laugh. And her analysis was really interesting. It wasn't necessarily what would make us laugh, but what would make kids laugh. And they, they pun, they wordplay, a lot of potty humor, particularly if they're two, three years old, four years old, and they're a boy. But they have this, this often delightful sense of humor. They can have um, a good sense of observation and be perceptive. Intense. Intense is definitely a word for gifted people. Um, it's. <laughs> I had an I had an administrator say to me one time, 
Joan, you're so intense. And I looked at him, I said, you're making a point and I don't get it. I don't think anything's wrong with intensity. Intensity is a sign of intelligence. I didn't say that to my principal. I really wanted to though. So if you have these little people around you that are really intense, I understand that it's part of their nature, very passionate. Sensitive to small changes in the environment, that's part of the Dabrowski thing. Often introverted, even though they express themselves as being extroverted and they get along with all kinds of people, they need time to themselves. And they don't get that at school. So parents understand when your little ones come home and your middle schoolers and your high schoolers and they just want to go to their room and read or they want to just play with their Legos, they just want to be by themselves, that's okay because they have been extroverts all day long. They have gone out for research, recess, they have had lunch in the lunchroom with all the kids, they, they've participated in all the games and activities and group projects and they are exhausted emotionally. Sometimes they're aware and perceive the world differently than others. Um, we see examples of that. S they tend to have a tolerance sometimes for ambigu ambiguity and complexities, particularly as they get older. And they may see many sides of an issue and consider many points of view. Um, these are the kids that become the diplomats and the um, um, mediators in their groups and often have a childlike sense of wonder. They just are uh, just enthused by the world, open to experiences, and believe it or not, can be emotionally stable and serene. I see this as part of my responsibility and I see this part as a responsibility at home. If our kids are well nurtured, they will be serene and they will be emotionally stable. What motivates them? What are their values? perfectionism. They set high standards for themselves, sometimes unrealistically so, and they set this for others around them. Part of our job here at school and your job at home is to help them negotiate their way through the concept of, profession, of being perfect all the time. Um, some of it is you can't do this yet, but you will. Some of it is age determinant. Um, physical determinant, you, you're not going to be able to do that until you're a bit stronger. You know, um, you're not going to be able to do research this until you can, um, your reading is more sophisticated when you're in high school or college. Helping kids to understand that it will happen, it may not happen right at this moment. You can also be the one to negotiate things for them. They're interested in something, um, dinosaurs, you know, and there's aspects of it that are really complex, um, or physics, or black holes, or quantum theory. You can help them by going to museums, by finding books at the library and exploring it with them, just to help satisfy curiosity, but so they don't beat themselves up that I can't do this right away. Sometimes we have to wait a little bit very curious and have a desire to know, very independent and autonomous. They're motivated not by rewards and praise, but by their own internal drive. This is the piece right there that's so hard for you as parents and for teachers in school because so much of what our society has conditioned us to is to do things for grades or to do things for rewards or to do things for the prize. And it's really hard for us as parents and often teachers when a kid says, I don't care, well, but, but you're, not, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna get the trophy. No, it's all right. So understand that that's not necessarily the motivation. You can work that to your advantage though, because what ultimately the prize is learning, is satisfying curiosity. So you're doing the science project or you're doing the National History Day project not for the reward at the end or the award, but for the satisfaction of learning as you go and being able to share that with um, outwardly to a group of people that would be fascinated by it. They are looking for patterns in life, for meaning in life. Um, they like 
challenges and they have a pensions for risk taking. For middle school kids, this was a real concern of mine. Um, and the more I learned about brain research in the 90s, the more I understood um, how the dopamine is the, is the feel good hormone up in your brain. Um, that dopamine is released when we do something that's exciting or exhilarating. Why do kids shoplift? Why do they experiment with drugs? Why do they drive too fast? You know, all this reckless behavior. There's a dopamine rush that they're getting. My objective with middle school kids became helping them get that rush, jazzing their brains with things that were intellectually stimulating. Finding what their passions were and really digging into and tapping into those passions so that their brain would get that satisfaction. And literally, jazz is the word that neuroscientists use when your brain is really excited about something, it's jazz. Um, and that, that gives them the, the rush, that they're, that endorphin rush that they're looking for. These are often our social warriors. They have a strong sense of outrage at social injustices. They're looking for um, peace and goodwill. Um, and you can help them to negotiate that through the world because we all know that the world isn't necessarily peaceful and just. Sometimes they have such a wide range of interests that it's really hard for them to zero in and focus. Um, I'll give you some advice as a teacher, but also as a parent. I think it's very important, and, and Grit, Duckworth's work on, um, on resiliency supports this. When students start something, they need to finish it. So, if they want to play trombone, and they start music lessons, and they're playing tr their trombone in September, they need to play that trombone all the way until June. It's a year-long commitment. And it's not just a commitment to, their, to themselves, but to their teacher and to the band that they play with. If they start ice skating or judo or whatever, whatever the term of the, the time is, they need to finish it. Um, my daughter is raising a, a five and a three-year-old now. And she, had, I think is, it's brilliant, but she has the kids doing things in little bites. So Mallory did dance for three months, and they did judo for a six-week course, and they do piano lessons um, with like four weeks or six weeks at a time. So there's a, a, a beginning and there's an end point. And at the end point, then you assess how did you like that? Would you like to continue? Um, if, there, if the program is developed in such a way, there should be some kind of assessment, authentic assessment, and for dancers or musicians, it's the recital at the end of the year. When my kids were growing up and doing music, there was, they, they always persevered, because it was ex that was the expectation, to the end of the year, but then came the recital and the applause. And I was raising these little showboats. And they liked the idea of performing. And then that motivated them into the next year of their music lessons. And they are, today, all, all still involved with their music. Um, not professionally, but as wonderful avocations. So I would, I would encourage this wide range of interests encourage them to pursue things that are interesting to them, but instead of just a scatter shot, focus in on something, it, we're gonna begin it and end it, and then we'll move on to something else. It helps with that level of, of discipline. Strong moral convictions, integrity, and honesty. Um, interestingly, high drive, visionaries, sense of destiny, and loving ideas, loving discussions. Sometimes, note that these are writ large, not writ small, but sometimes we see these in kids. Being sincere, accepting others, accepting themselves. I think that the ones that are writ small for motivation and values have a lot to do with how we nurture and what experiences that they're able to have so that they can develop that part of themselves. Activity. 
a great deal of energy. Difficulty falling asleep at night, physically being exhausted, mentally being wide awake. Have a little grandson who just as soon as he starts to doze off, he wakes up, he says, we need to go downstairs now. There's something more to do. There's something more to think about. Um, difficult. Cindy has a little one at home and she's anticipating going home tonight and AJ will still be awake and it will be the hour process of telling stories and singing songs and helping them to wind down. Um, reading books is a, a great way to do this. When Noni is taking care of young John, we read 10 books at bedtime. Mom and Daddy read three, but Noni reads 10. And boy, little John, he's four years old, he's Eyes are, his little eyes are closing and he's just struggling. But boy, let me tell you, I'll say, John, we can finish the, the last three tomorrow. No, no, we have to read 10. So we do, we read all 10. Great deal of activity and energy and sometimes that manifests itself as intellectual energy. Just be aware of that. Interestingly, this one surprises teachers that these kids have a long attention span and sustained concentration. And teachers will say to me, I've never seen that in my classroom with him, never. Well, no, because the classroom is 48 minutes and then we move on to something else. And it's 48 minutes and then we move on to something else. And you're into something really interesting and then you get to the end of the chapter and you move on to something else. So no, you're not gonna see that sustained and deep um, uh, dive into, some, into a sustained concentration because school often doesn't allow that. But you at home, parents do. So if they start the Lego building and it goes on for two weeks and it's on the dining room table and you're working around it, you know, so be it. And when they're, when, when they're finished with creating their whole medieval castle scene, they'll be willing to take it down. Um, it can happen with books, it can happen with art, it can happen with music, it can happen with anything. That they're, they have a, a tremendous focus. Um, I had a parent, I had several parents tell me that on the weekend they would call their 12 year old or their 13, 14 year old, my middle school kids, to lunch, you know, it'd be 11.30, Come, you know, lunch pretty soon for lunch, it's Saturday. I'll be down a little bit, 12.30. I'll be down in a little bit, one o'clock. I'll be down when I'm done and about two o'clock. They would come down for lunch and they had finished whatever they were involved in. Um, take the sandwich up to them, honestly. <laughs> you know, encourage whatever, whatever you can do to help them to sustain that level of concentration where they're not interrupted. But it's of things that are of interest to them. Working themselves to exhaustion, actually thinking themselves to exhaustion, just not being able to let go. We talked about this, needing the periods of contemplation and solitude. Hard to do at school, that's what you can do at home for them. Giving them space, giving them a place, giving them time to unwind, relax, reflect, contemplate. Often these kids are spontaneous, you know, they, they like, like how, let's, let's go to the museum today. Social relationships, we talked about Sheldon a little bit. Asking questions that are often embarrassing or qu seem to question authority. My, my favorite story on this is young John's mother, Kate, is Dr. Kate Callahan, thank you very much, is a geriatrician, brilliant. Kate's one of the smartest women I've ever met. Um, when Kate was like six, she got thrown out of CCD. This is uh, school for Catholic kids because she asked inappropriate questions, like why? Like, how does that work? <laughs> a lot of um, religious teaching is grounded in faith. And Kate, even as a six-year-old, was a scientist. She has grown into her faith, and she now can understand that the two can coexist. But as a six-year-old, it was like, I don't think that's possible. And boy, let me tell you, her parents got called in and she was asked to not come back to CCD, asking embarrassing or non-conforming questions. And this will happen in the classroom as well. Sometimes feels different, out of step with others, 
Um, the idea that nobody gets my jokes, nobody's interested in what I'm interested in. Parents, if you sometimes feel like you're your kid's friend and you're their companion, you are because you accept them unconditionally. You will do what they need to do. You'll take them places they want to go. Um, you won't question them about, well, wouldn't you rather be outside with you know the kids in the neighborhood playing soccer? Because you understand that, no, they really don't want to do that. They have other things that they really want to do. We also help them to understand how to be socially um, able how to be polite, how to be thoughtful. Um, John, young John, has been told not to point. Pointing is, is impolite, but we can gesture. So we were out to dinner just recently, and I said, oh, the people over there are having a birthday party. He says, no need. People over there are having a birthday party. So we can teach them some of the graciousness um, this is Sheldon. Sheldon learned this from his friends, what was appropriate and inappropriate, um, and helping them feel less out of step with their peers. They can be very compassionate, and they can feel great empathy for others um, and help others to, to understand. So, activity levels, values, motivations, academic cognition. Now, look at this. In my program, and Hillsborough is following the same philosophy, and this is Joe and Zoli's philosophy, in so many gifted programs, and I'm, I hope to say that there's less now than there used to be, look at what gets kids screened out of giftedness, that they're bored with routine tasks, that they refuse to do rote homework, that they um, have difficulty moving on to a new topic, that they're impatient with failures and self-critical, that they're critical of others and of their teacher. Um, they disagree vocally with others and the teacher. They make jokes or puns at inappropriate times. They're emotionally sensitive. They may overreact, get too, too anger too easily, cry too easily, frustrated. They're not interested in details, a hand in messy work. Well, yeah, if it's just rote work, and just get it done. They refuse to accept authority stubborn, non-conforming, uh, tend to dominate others. This is from Dr. Roger Taylor, one of the, uh, just a great guy, a highly gifted guy, really, really gets gifted people. Um, he put this together and it, when I first saw this many years ago, I, I wanted to cry because it's really true. Everything that makes them who they are, instead of working with that, developing that, celebrating that, we smack their hands and say, no, you're not supposed to behave that way. So for too many years, who did get into gifted programs? The bright, shiny apples that liked to do routine tasks, did school well, liked the teacher, never talked back, was very good with their peers, you know, never questioned anything, liked to do the rote work. So in Hillsboro, understanding these concepts and trying to work with these concepts with kids. That's what the programming is about. From third grade all the way through the high school and the outreach internship program, providing opportunities for kids that are appropriate for them, appropriate for what their needs are. Um, if you have a bright, shiny apple, you are so blessed because they are always going to do well, they're going to be happy, and they're going to be very successful in school and beyond. They already have the beginnings of the competencies for the 21st century. They often are good learners and they can self-direct. Um, they're looking at research and they'll do that. They're good communicators. They work well with teams. Um, they are learning to be creative and practical problem solvers all to be good citizens, globally aware citizens. Our gifted kids are intrinsically motivated learners. They are voracious consumers of information and research. They need to learn to be effective communicators. They need to learn to be collaborative team members. They already are creative problem solvers. So, 
working towards the ideal of the 20th century learner and the, and the skills for the 20th century, we look at our kids and assess what their needs are and try to help them develop what those needs are um, as they move through school. Okay, so I'm going to turn this back to Cindy and then at the end we're really happy to take questions. So as far as what we do in the program here, like Dr. Rudderman said, we really want to give students the opportunity to grow and develop in their areas of interest. So there are a lot of options, like Dr. Rudderman said, choice is very important for all students, but particularly students who have this combination of high ability, creativity, and task commitment. So a lot of the projects in REACH classes offer students choice and a creative expression for whatever they're learning. So that's a little bit about the program here. As far as um, the way that we try to meet all those needs, again, through both the pull-out program, the enrichment support, and the coursework as students get older, um, offering more in-depth opportunities to learn, extending what they're learning in the curriculum, and really helping students become self-directed and giving them the time to do that self-directed work. So how do we identify students that we believe need this additional programming? We use a universal screener, which is the cognitive abilities test. It's been given for decades and it's been normed nationally and there's a, a lot of data about the validity and reliability. There are no perfect standardized tests out there. The COGAT is one of the most widely used and well-regarded of these types of tests that we would use as a universal screener. The purpose in using a universal screener is to try to make sure that our Hillsborough gifted and talented programming reflects the diversity of our community. So there's also research out there that the COGAT is one of the more fair tests for all the groups of students that we have represented in the district. What it looks like in an actual classroom is that all the students are taking together with the teacher, they're all plugging their headphones into the computer and listening to the test as they want to go through in their own pace. They can press a little button and repeat the questions if they want to, and they're just tapping pictures on the screen. So if you're thinking, well, my second grader isn't really reading fluently yet, how are they going to take a standardized test? That's how. It's all oral questions, and it's all picking pictures that are the answers. So um, they will take the test over three days. It's only about 30 minutes worth of actual questions, but the kids, again, can take as much time as they want. And because they're all working independently, you don't have to worry that your child is going to feel stressed or rushed. I give teachers very specific guidance about presenting this as a puzzle to children and reminding all the children that they can do well on it and they can answer the questions and they have what it takes to show what they know um, on, on this puzzle, if you will. So when I report scores back, hopefully by April, you'll get three different scores. One is a verbal score, one is a quantitative score, so loosely um, ability in literacy, loosely ability in math, um, and then a nonverbal score, which is a visual spatial measure. So, and then you'll get an overall score that combines those three. So for each of those areas, you'll get information about um, how your child compares both to their peers nationally for every one of the thousands of children that takes this test across the nation. And you'll also get information about how your child compares specifically to their grade level peers in Hillsborough. And just as a preview, typically that reads something like 60% nationally, you know, your child did better than 60% of kids nationally, and your child with the same score did better than 40% of students in Hillsborough. And parents call me panicked. Well, my child didn't do that well compared to their peers in Hillsborough. And again and again, I say, we are very fortunate to live in a district where there are a lot of students who are very high achieving, higher achieving than the national average. So that's how it translates in scores for students, generally. As far as how to prepare, we encourage you to maintain a regular routine. There's a lot of research out there that stress inhibits cognitive function. We've all experienced this when, we, when we've taken tests, right? So we want to try to maximize the normalcy for children, and we do that in the classroom. So basically all we would want you to do is make sure they're eating breakfast, make sure they're getting a good night's sleep, 
if they ask you about it or if you want to bring it up with them, just stress that it's not a be all end all that measures their worth. It's just something to help us understand how they think. Um, you can also help by making sure your child has working headphones. So if you sent headphones in at the beginning of the year and you haven't heard anything, you might just want to ask, hey, have you used your headphones recently? Are they still working? Um, because that'll just be one less thing the teacher has to worry about. We do do a test the week before to make sure all the headphones are working, but you know, being a working mom, I can understand that you don't want to have to go out and buy headphones like at 7 p.m. the night before the test. So we do have extras in the district. So your child is not going to go without headphones. But again, just in terms of thinking about how you could help your child feel prepared and as least stressed as possible on the day of the testing, that would be one way. This is going to happen the week of January 27th. And again, I say April because, you know, we have children who travel, we have children who are ill, we do makeup testing. Now the REACH teachers are spread over two schools, so, you know, the makeup testing used to be able to happen in one week, but now if the teachers are only at that school one or two days that particular week, then that might push into the week after. And you can see how, you know, with kids in and out of buildings, this can roll on for quite a while. And we really do make an effort to get every second grader tested, so that does take us a little bit of time. Um, then once I get all the tests done, we analyze the results, I meet with the second grade teachers, that again adds time to the process, but we roll that in because it's often helpful for a parent to know, um, did this score, you know, did the teacher really look at what my child earned on this test and does it match what they see in the classroom and so we sit and look at all that information together so that if you have questions, the teacher can say with confidence, well, you know, when I thought about this, before you contacted me, this either does or, or doesn't represent what I typically see in the classroom. And then I aggregate all the information and you'll get a personalized email. So again, the formal process starts with the universal screener, that's the COGAT, and that's one of the data points that we use. But like I mentioned, all of our programs have multiple data points again, that we've carefully selected because we think that they are the best measures to tell whether a child will succeed in a particular program. So we use the COGAT test for basically an ability and potential measure. Because it's a pullout program and children will miss instruction, we also use an achievement test, which tells us basically how they're doing in reading, writing, and, and mathematics. And then we also use a creativity assessment because the program is based in creative expression. Again, going back to that definition of, of giftedness from um, the University of Connecticut and then also following the National Association for Gifted Children programmatic standards which tell us that our assessments should match whatever program that we have. So those are the steps of the formal identification process. About the top 20% of students on the COGAT take these additional two tests as long as parents give permission. So you'll hear from me every step of the way. Either way, whether we want to screen your child for REACH or not, you'll get COGAT results. Those come in two flavors. They come in the flavor of, um, we'd like permission to further screen your child with these other two tests, or these are your children's scores, this is how they compare to their peers in Hillsborough, and at this time, we're not, we're not recommending that they participate in any gifted and talented programming. We think that they will be well served by their classroom teacher. That doesn't mean, however, I, this is a common area of misperception, that if your child is not participating in reach through a formal identification sticker, that they aren't being challenged in their classroom. So we do a lot of professional development with teachers about the idea of differentiating instruction, which means if you're a first grader and you're reading chapter books, you're maybe in the back of the classroom reading while we're all doing um, some basic um, vocabulary exercises, for example. Um, so the teachers are always thinking about ways to extend the learning of students who have already mastered whatever they are teaching in a particular unit. We do a lot of pre-assessment, which means at the beginning of the unit, teachers will do some quick activities to see how much the students know. So if we're in math and we're focusing on multiplication tables and we already have a student who can multiply two-digit numbers, well, they might not be doing as many of the um, games that help with basic multiplication facts. Teachers are constantly doing that. And because you know your child so well, and because your child may share things with you that they don't volunteer to their classroom teacher, it's important for you to give us feedback, particularly to contact your child's classroom teacher if there's an area in which you think your child needs more challenge. And the teacher may be able to say to you, I'll take a closer look at that, or they may be able to tell you, well, I noticed that too, and here's what I'm doing about that. 
So please don't ever hesitate to let someone in the district know if you think there's a particular area that we could be further enriching your child's learning. Other ways you can cultivate your child's talent besides showing up on a Thursday night to hear about gifted and talented behaviors and how you can support gifted and talented children, you can connect with our library in town. They have a newsletter that they send out. If you don't already receive it, I highly recommend it. They are constantly running different programs just to expose kids to things. I mean, how do you know if your kid would be passionate about coding if they've never tried coding? So they can go to the library and try coding. Um, there's the New Jersey Association for Gifted Children, which is just a, a nonprofit organization. You don't need any special paperwork to go to their events or to have your child participate in the activities that they offer. There's also some great resources out there from Public Broadcasting Service, for example. One in particular that I like is called Adventures in Learning, and it gives suggestions to go do different things outside with your child or research certain topics or do you know bathtub science experiments. So those are just some humble ideas of how, you know, if you think your child needs more enrichment, um, has some passions that they want to explore, some things that you can do at home. So our goal, again, is to meet the needs of each child. You are an important partner in this process, and we always invite you to contact us with questions, ideas, concerns, because that's part of how we can best serve the need of your child and your family. You can always contact me. We are going to take questions and answers, but if you have one that you would like to discuss more on a one-to-one -one basis, again, this is literally my job, but also a real area of passion and interest. So at this point, we will open the floor for questions. Um, we do ask that you use a microphone, and if you don't use a microphone, um, don't be surprised when I repeat your question. That way it can be picked up by the audio. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming out tonight and look forward to partnering with you for the success of your child in the future. That's a great question. The question was, if your child is selected to participate in the pullout programs in grades three and four, what do they miss? And the answer is it varies um, by the individual building schedule. There are some building schedules where the REACH teacher and the principal are able to work it out so that they are mostly missing intervention and enrichment time. Um, but there are some cases where students miss either literacy or mathematics instruction. Um, sometimes they miss the discipline nearest and dearest to my heart, social studies. It really varies, and because we do try to make it 120 minutes um, during a 60 cycle, it might be one subject, part of one subject one day, part of a subject another day. The reach teacher and the classroom teacher and the principal do try to make sure that if they are missing part of their mathematics time, for example, it will be after the teacher does the introduction to the lesson and during the independent practice time that they would be going with the reach teacher. Um, in the hundreds of students that I've seen go through the program during my time here, there's only been one or two cases where we um, had to think creatively about how a child could balance both participation in the REACH program and being in the classroom for instruction that, that we thought was very necessary. So the question was about how the groupings are done um, by grade. So for example, in third grade at Woodfern, um, do all the third graders in Woodfern meet together? And that depends on the number of students and the idiosyncrasies of the schedule. We do try to keep the groups relatively small, um, both practically because many of the reach teachers don't have full classrooms, um, but also because with project-based learning and self-direction, it can help the teachers to have smaller groups of students. So it really depends on the schedule um, and the number of students at the school because we don't have a rule that says we're gonna have five gifted and talented third graders at Amsterdam. We compare all the students across the district and, and make sure that we can fit whatever children we think need the program into the program. So the question was about the pullout program and whether the students are cluster grouped in classrooms. 
Cluster grouping is a best practice in gifted and talented education. I will say that I don't get to do the assignments for elementary classrooms, so it is a request that um, the gifted and talented specialists and I make of the principals and um, the counselors and specialists who schedule in the buildings. So most often there is a cluster of you know, three or four students in one classroom and three or four students in another classroom in a certain grade. So this question was just to confirm that for the cognitive abilities test, it's as much time as the students want, and it is. There is no time limit, um, and they can repeat the questions and take however long they want with the questions. They can take time to go back through their work, so there's they can take as much time as they want. So uh, is there a specific date So the question was about the dates. Um, I can be a little more specific, so thank you for reminding me. Um, we usually say the week of because if there's snow or if there are technical problems, that's the goal is to get it done that week. Um, but we do plan on starting on Monday at Amsterdam, HES, and Woods Road, and then the other three schools, um, let's see if I can get this right, Triangle and Sunnymead and Woodfern will start on Tuesday. Um, and that's a function of we are down reach teachers, we are down computer teachers, and we want to make sure that we have someone who's very familiar with the testing platform in the building when the first day of testing is happening. So we didn't want to start the testing in all six schools in one day this year, which we had done in the past, but again, we're working under different conditions this year. So that's one of the challenges of the formal identification process, and it's one of the, okay, so the question was, if a child is identified at the end of second grade, do they continue on in the program? And the simple answer is yes. Um, but that creates some challenges. So for example, a child might qualify with a specific strength in mathematics, um, and also high creativity and overall high ability in the end of second grade. And they participate in the pullout program in third and fourth grade, and they can pick different projects to do that relate to their mathematical passion. But then they get to fifth grade and it's a program in social studies. So as of now, that is how the program has worked. Um, and we've, we've discussed different ways to move forward. The challenge again with the formal identification, the pullout program is, um, you know, if a child qualifies in third and fourth grade and then we only have a social studies program in fifth grade and they don't qualify for it, well, did I just de-gift your child? Um, so that's a little challenging and it's something that we've talked about how we can address that so that we are making sure that the, the program is a good fit for all the children. Um, again, in all the years here, I've only had a, a handful of students who didn't want to do the REACH social studies once they got to the intermediate level. That is a great question. The question was why in fifth grade does gifted and talented programming switch to social studies? Uh, the simple answer is from a staffing perspective. So we don't have any gifted specialists at the intermediate and middle school levels that are without a content area. So um, I've looked at different ways to schedule a more um, open-ended and less content-driven gifted and talented program um, at the intermediate and middle level, um, it comes down to needing staff. And I have requested a, a gifted specialist at the intermediate and middle school levels, along with Mr. Carey and Dr. Trabolski, um, for the past six years. So the question was, um, once in fifth grade um, reach social studies, would they continue in that? And the answer is yes.
So the first time we um, have separate courses for math, for example, is in sixth grade. So there is an advanced class, math class in, that they would qualify for at the end of fifth grade to take in sixth grade. Um, that's not necessarily a standardized test, um, although we will use the New Jersey Student Learning Assessment as one data point. There are also a number of assessments that students take in class as part of their regular instruction and assessment cycles that factor into advanced placement in the middle level at sixth grade and up. So the question was, if a child does not qualify for the REACH program at the end of second grade, can they qualify later on? And the answer is yes. Um, every year there are children who we think are going to qualify, but then we end up being surprised when the test results come back. And there's a variety of ways that we handle that, on, you know, individually working with the teacher and student um, to make sure that they're enriched in the classroom. There is the opportunity every spring for teachers to nominate students in grades three through seven for participation in the program next year. So yes, they can be tested in other years. If they are nominated by the teacher, do they retake all of those assessments? So the question is, do they retake the same assessments? Yes, um, just appropriate to that grade level. So in third grade, they would take the creativity assessment to participate in fourth grade. Then once they get to fourth grade, they, they wouldn't take that because the program isn't focused on creativity in the middle level. Mm -hmm. That's another good question about teacher input. I'm happy to talk to any teacher that wants to talk to me about how they think a child will best be served by our programs. Um, I do meet with the second grade teachers to review the COGAT data. So that's um, the point where I would be getting input from the teachers. The question was about after second grade, do we do any more universal screen, screening assessments to test all the children? We do not. However, in third grade, students take the New Jersey Student Learning Assessment, so we do have a standardized test score for children from third grade forward. So part of the reason why we do the COGAT in second grade, not only is it considered kind of a best practice in the field that you don't try to do standardized tests with a five-year-old, um, it's also because we don't have any of the other measures that we have at some of the older grades. So the question was if um, a student does really well on the NJSLA, can that factor into participation in the REACH program or at least um, a nomination for screening and I think a high score on the NJ SLA is very compelling in terms of encouraging a teacher recommendation. Um, I think it's rare that there's a teacher that says absolutely not, you know, this child who scored exceeding expectations on the NJ SLA should not be screened for reach. Um, I haven't seen that happen. Um, and I'm really good at wait time, so I did see another hand pop up once I waited long enough. That's a good question, um, and that aligns with everything that Dr. Ruderman said that we could expect from a gifted and talented learner. So the question was, how do we handle a student who um, qualifies for the REACH program but does not like it? I have only had that happen once out of the hundreds of kids that have gone through the program while I've been in this position. <laughs> and um, we tend to ask the child to meet with the school counselor, um, actually twice, twice um, it's happened. Um, once I even met with the child myself, um, we try to figure out what's going on. Um, so there have been a couple times it came up, but there's only been once or twice where a child really didn't want to participate in the program. We're not going to drag a child kicking and screaming down the hall. 
So if the child really feels like the classroom is going to be a better place for their learning, we'll honor that, but we'll do everything that we can to make sure that we're creating an environment in the REACH classroom where kids want to go, where they get to explore their interests, and where they feel valued by their teacher and peers. So we treat it how we treat any struggle in the school district. We get a committee of people together, we gather as much information as we can, and then we involve the parent as a partner and the child as a partner and the teacher as a partner in figuring out what the best steps forward are. Uh, can I just jump in? Um, you have the fifth grader who's the math kid that's in the REACH program in social studies. Um, well, what I wanted to say is um, one of the things that the, the kids are able to do at the fifth, sixth grade level, middle school level, is the New Jersey History Day program. And um, as, a, as a trainer and as a, a judge for National History Day, um, the classic line that I use is it doesn't have to be history, it has to have history. So kids can do um, ice hockey, they can do uh, Coco Chanel, they can do projects and they do do projects on math. Um, literally anything. And the idea that it has to have history, they, they need to analyze um, where something comes from, the context in which it develops, and then ultimately the so what. And you can't really analyze something um, unless there's about 30 years or more of literally history that will allow you to do that. So that's something that might be um, interesting for him or her. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about um, often when kids get to the high school and they have opportunities to take AP courses, um, they'll take AP courses to be with um, a group of peers. Just to, kids, remember the idea of, of pace, things that move faster, um, so even though they're not necessarily a language kid or a literature kid, they'll take the AP courses just because they, those, those classes move very quickly. And they also like the idea of what they see as authentic assessment. There's um, the AP exam at the end of it. But for most AP kids, the real fun begins in May after the test is over. And then what do you do until the end of the year? And then they can, um, AP teachers tend to be highly uh, creative and do some really cool stuff. And they can do some really in-depth projects. So it may be that um, students will find a reason to uh, be in reach that's not necessarily um, content-based or even academic, but it has to do with the social and the peer and the, and the pace of the class. Any other questions? So I think the question was whether the program is similar in the elementary schools and in, okay, so in the elementary school, students can do independent projects about all different subjects. So for example, um, one of the units is about puzzles and they can create a puzzle that has to do with any area of interest. So I've seen puzzles about endangered species and I've seen puzzles about um, mathematicians and all kinds of different puzzles. Um, so that would be an example of a project in the elementary level where there's all different areas um, and kids can just follow their interest. Then once they get to the intermediate level, reach formally happens in social studies. And then once they're in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, they can qualify for advanced math or advanced literacy. Once they get to the high school, there are honors courses in all the disciplines. There, yes, essentially yes. They're screening for each of those different programs. Um, So oftentimes, the teacher recommendation is, is part of the process, but not the only part. So the question was, how are kids selected um, into other programs like advanced math and literacy? So their assessments are typically ones that are given to the entire grade. So we're always collecting data about all the students, um, and then we're placing them accordingly 
based on how kids have, who have had similar scores in the past on similar assessments have done in those classes. Um, so when I place for social studies, I will say, you know, these are the four things I considered and this is a score that um, students who typically did well in the class before have earned. So the question was if the test is conducted in school or outside of school and it's all, all of our data points are collected in school because we don't want to have any issues with someone not being able to make the test or not being able to drive their child or not knowing about it or anything like that. Oh, the NJSLA test, yes, again, is a test that's given during the school day. So the question was whether students who qualify for REACH have any advantage in getting into other classes, and the answer is no. Um, each class we look at what we believe is going to be the best indicator of whether a child will succeed in that class. So take advanced math in the middle school. We're looking at math assessments from that, that previous year, New Jersey SLA scores, things like that, that are the most current indications of learning for that particular child that relate to that area of that program. So I'm always available if you have further questions. Um, again, my contact information is up there. You can find it on the website. I really appreciate everyone coming out tonight and I hope that um, this was helpful to you. If you have a partner who is not here this evening, the presentation will be online in a couple of days so they can go and watch the whole thing, um, or if there's anyone else that you think would benefit from seeing it, it will be posted on the website under the REACH section of the curriculum site. So again, thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great evening.